Hello, everybody. I'm Philip Calder. I'm a professor at the University of Southampton in the UK. It's my pleasure to be chairing this webinar today. So on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, welcome to today's webinar. This is part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Topics in the series uh, cover different research areas uh, in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give delegates the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers for other webinar events. Please look at the website for more details. In today's webinar, you'll hear from the Biochemical Society's 2022 Morton Lecture winner, Professor Valerie O'Donnell from Cardiff University here in the UK. Valerie is a biochemist whose research is focused on using mass spectrometry for identification of lipid mediators of inflammation. This is a really hot area right now. For the last 15 years, Valerie has studied how modified phospholipids generated by circulating vascular cells regulate vascular inflammation and thrombosis. She's particularly focused on molecular species of lipids termed enzymatically oxidized phospholipids. These are made by platelets, neutrophils, monocytes, and eosinophils. And these compounds were identified by her group. She's going to tell us about the biochemical and biophysical mechanisms of action of these enzymatically oxidized phospholipids. And the group has also shown how they regulate cellular function, for example, neutrophil antibacterial actions and the transcriptional activation of monocytes. These, of course, are important parts of innate immunity. Other areas of Valerie's research include delineating how oxylipins are removed during inflammation. There's so much focus on the production of these bioactive uh, uh, mediators, but we also need to consider how they're removed. Her group has recently published the first lipidomic characterization of the viral envelope of the SARS-CoV-2, which is bringing us right up to date, Valerie. So Valerie is going to give her presentation uh, very shortly. Uh, you can put your questions um, in the box and then um, I'll sort of curate those questions and uh, we'll deal with them after Valerie's presentation. And we'll try and answer as many of uh, your questions as we can. So Valerie, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, congratulations on the 2022 Morton Lecture. Thank you very much, Philip, for your kind introduction today and also to the Biochemical Society panel for um, the award of the Morton Lecture for this year. Um, it's an absolute honour to have, have been bestowed this. And um, I want to say also, you know, big appreciation, obviously, you know, the previous winner by two was a very close colleague of mine, Michael Wakelin, um, who passed away due to COVID two years ago. So it's also a, a kind of an honour to follow in his footsteps in this respect. Um, and as part of the lecture uh, for the Bio Biochemical Society, um, I wrote a review article which was published earlier this year in the Biochemical Society Transactions. And that was really interesting to write because it was it allowed me to go back in time and look into the kind of origins of the land cycle, how Bill Lambs discovered it, and, and really think about how this this now is, is moving into new arenas, how we're really understanding how the land cycle is important, um, not just as a mechanism for recycling phospholipids, but in, in innate immunity and, and inflammation. Um, so uh, I think because of this being um, a Morton lecture, I'm, I'm covering a little bit more, I guess, than just um, the lipid uh, signaling work that we do. And I thought I'll go back a little bit in time and talk about where I kind of came from. And it's a chance to revisit old papers and realise just how long ago this work was done. So I started off as a PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Bristol. I had a, a joint position with Smith Line Beecham, who went on to become GSK. And the advantage of that was being able to go and work in their fantastic labs up in, at Well and uh, Garden City. And I had a co-supervisor there who was Dave Chu, shown in this photograph. And uh, the project was really my, it was my first chance to use mass spectrometry uh, all the way back to my PhD. And there we were looking at how inhibitors called any, uh, iodonium compounds, you can see here in the middle of this, this um, compound here, how they inhibit NADPH oxidase, which is the enzyme in neutrophils that make superoxide. So Smith and Beecham were interested in these inhibitors and this target because they were considering that this could be anti-inflammatory, that if you block superoxide generation in neutrophils, you might have a way to help dampen down inflammation in, in arthritis and other chronic diseases. So we were looking at the mechanism and trying to see whether this could be useful 
they turned out to be not very specific, unfortunately. So they didn't become uh, therapeutics, but they did end up being cited in the Sigma catalog, this biochemical journal paper, um, because of the mechanism and because they are still kind of the most widely used tools for inhibiting NADPH oxidase uh, even today. So first time using a mass spectrometer was up at the um, industrial lab where we had, were using fast atomic bombardment MS to look at radical adducts from phen phenol radicals and the flavin cofactor. Um, and it worked really well. We were able to uh, identify the mechanism of action of these inhibitors very nicely. And then I spent a year working at the Rouge Research Institute in Aberdeen. And really, this was kind of the heyday of, of free radical research and the kind of free radical hypothesis of, of uh, vascular disease and, and disease in general. So there was a lot of work going on trying to understand chemical mechanisms of free radical signaling and free radical reactions in human tissue. So here, working with Mark Berkett, who was an expert on electron spin resonance spectroscopy, we were looking at how mitochondria make free radicals inside endothelial cells. And I learned a lot in that year about how to use EPR spectroscopy for um, looking at free radical production in cells. And this is the kind of signal you would get when you give a, a low molecular weight organic hydroperoxide to endothelial cells. And then you block their mitochondrial respiration in different ways. You uncouple or you block and you can completely dampen that signal. So it was only a short time, but it was a great learning curve. And then I think how, how I really got into lipid oxidation and, and the study of lipids was really through a two year, um, two and a half year stint in Switzerland in Angelo Atzi's lab, where he was also interested in mitochondrial um, superoxide generation. And we were studying this and we kind of stumbled across something a little bit unexpected, which is it's always the kind of more interesting way to do science is if you're kind of playing around and you see something interesting and you follow the route and see where it goes. So. What I'd noticed quite unexpectedly was if we added NADH or NADPH to the outside of cells, I don't ask me why we were doing this because it's, it's not kind of obvious, but I guess if cells are dead or dying, they will release these nucleotides to the external space. But when we added these to fibroblasts, we started to see generation of quite a lot of superoxide on the outside of the cells. So we were trying to characterize what enzyme this was. And I think, you know, we didn't work out what it was at the time. We could see the phenomenon. We thought it was something to do with lipid metabolism because of the effect of fatty acids on this, but it's probably what is now termed uh, NOx uh, or duox enzymes, which have long been characterized by David Harrison and many other groups since. But anyway, at the time, it looked like this phenomenon was, was happening and it may have involved a lipid metabolism enzyme. So I reached out to Hartman Kuhn, who is, was one of the, and still is, one of the really kind of big global leads in the area of 15 lipoxygenase, it's, it's biochemistry and it's vascular signaling, action, it's vascular actions. And so collaborating with Hartman, we were able to look at the enzymology of this and how the lipoxygenase oxidizes NADH and NADPH. And here you can see this is spe spectrophotometry, um, adding the enzyme in the presence of NADPH and lipid substrate, you know, the, the NADH is oxidized. And also it has a dampening effect on lipid oxidation itself. This is the lipoxygenase activity with NADH and without NADH in vitro, and then no effect on peroxidase. So this was all done with rabbit reticulocyte 15 lipoxygenase, which Hartmut generously provided. And so then kind of the start of really looking at, at lipid oxidation and, and lipid radicals and, and the kind of vascular aspects of of lipid oxidation sort of became more apparent in, in work that I did with Bruce Freeman's lab and Victor Darley Osmar at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And this was kind of like the mid 90s, I guess. And uh, Bruce, at that time, nitric oxide had been discovered 10 years before. It had been, the Nobel Prize had been awarded to Ignaro and colleagues for discovery of this really important gaseous signaling molecule. It was turning out to be incredibly important for vascular health um, and you know mediating uh, control of blood pressure, causing vascular relaxation, preventing platelet activation, etc. But in Bruce's lab, they were interested in the kind of crosstalk between nitric oxide, its reactive species that get formed when nitric oxide is further reacted with oxygen or superoxide, and how that might interface with lipid oxidation. And because I had done some lipid oxidation work with Hartmut, it was a really interesting way of getting into learning about nitric oxide and, and kind of reactive nitrogen species and their interactions within the vasculature of, of, of these kinds of processes. So the project I had in Bruce's lab was working with Victor and Bruce was really to look at how, um, how could we form um, lipids, you know, nitrated lipids. So you have an interaction between NO or nitrous oxide or um, nitrogen dioxide or peroxynitrite and an oxidizing lipid um, kind of mixture whether it's enzymatic or non-enzymatic, and, and what would be the products? You know, could you get stable products with nitro groups attached? So I kind of took it right back to the basic chemistry um, and was looking more at, oops, I've gone the wrong way, looking at the kind of basic 
chemistry of this and asking the question which reactions could generate stable nitrated species. So we looked at all of these and this is, these are two papers in chemical research and toxicology that really looked at that in detail. And we, we showed products that formed and we also showed that here this is a, an, an oxygen electrode and a nitric oxide electrode. And if you look here at the NO electrode, what you see is that normally you add some nitric oxide gas into an electrode and you see a signal and then it gradually decays as the nitric oxide diffuses out into the gas phase. But if there's a lipid oxidation system going on at the same time, and this could be lipids with, um, you know, in this case, this was a polyunsaturated fatty acid like arachidonic acid with a, a radical generating species uh, called ABA. And so you were oxidizing the lipid, and as you're oxidizing the lipid, you're finding that the NO is being consumed very rapidly. So reactions happen, nitrated lipids get formed, nitric oxide is consumed. This led me to start thinking, about how lipid oxidation might interfere with nitric oxide signaling and ask the question whether, you know, if, if nitric oxide is being removed, does that have an impact on how well it can signal in the vessel? So if we think about, you know, back at that time, there was a lot of interest in free radical hypothesis of atherosclerosis. So some excellent work coming out from many groups showing that oxidized lipids are present in atheroma lesions, for example, that they may come from lipoxygenase or they may come from non-enzymatic uh, metal-driven reactions. And of course, on the background of that, you have a lot of work going on on nitric oxide as a vasodilator, and people were uh, interested in how does it get removed and why can it not effectively mediate vasodilation in the context of blood, high blood pressure and atherosclerosis. So kind of putting these two concepts together, the question I had was, well, can lipid oxidation be part of why nitric oxide is being removed at an accelerated rate in humans who have atherosclerosis and, and high blood pressure and, and other forms of vascular disease? So we started looking at this uh, with um, ends, purified enzymes, cells that express 15 lipoxygenase, uh, et cetera. And we were able to show, this is myself, Bruce, uh, Hartmut, and Victor, and, and other, others, that you know, 15 lipoxygenase, again, with a nitric oxide electrode, here you have the NO being injected. It decays, as you would expect, and then you give the lipid substrate to the enzyme, and you get an accelerated decay. Add more nitric oxide, it's still decaying faster no cells. And so here, these are actually cells expressing high levels of 15 lipoxygenase. It's a transfected cell line, and here's the control cells that express beta-galactosidase instead, and you just don't see this accelerated NO removal at all here. So this was showing that enzymes that do undergo li that mediate lipid oxidation can remove nitric oxide, um, and you know, then, you know, does this happen in vivo? Does it have an effect on nitric oxide signaling in vivo is the, the next question. So I came back to Cardiff around that time. I was lucky enough to get a, a Wellcome Trust fellowship. And, um, you know, and I think one thing I'm wanting to point out with this talk, obviously, is that um, really the research that's been done over the last however many, you know, 20, 25 years that I'm talking about today, it, it, it involved a lot of people who were and still are working with me today. Um, and it's all down to the great work that those people did, collaborators, but also team members. And so from now on, a lot of the, the people that I'm showing and their photos are people who've worked directly in my group from when I came back to Cardiff. So this is Marcus Coffey and Barbara Coles, who um, were working with me in the early 2000s. And we were taking forward the idea that could nitric oxide consumption by 12 lipoxygenase have an effect on the activity of nitric oxide in the vasculature? So, you know, we know that nitric oxide works by activating granulate cyclase, therefore, could lipoxygenase removal have a negative impact on that? And we could see, first of all, looking in sort of here in tissue or in cell samples, that indeed it could, in theory. So this is now monocytes, pig monocytes, consuming nitric oxide in, uh, in the presence of lipid substrates. Here in this ones down here, we've got a lipoxygenase inhibitor. So the lipid substrate doesn't stimulate over background decay. Whereas in the absence of the lipoxygen is inhibitor, comparing it to the control, it has a, a significant effect. But also, interestingly, if we look at cyclic GMP generation in those monocytes, um, there's control. Give them a bolus of NO, they make cyclic GMP, and this is measured using a radioimmunoassay. Um, but if we give lipid substrates at the same time, then they don't make as much granulate cyclic, sorry, cyclic GMP at all. So clearly, it's like a proof of concept that you activate the lipoxygenase, nitric oxide can't stimulate cyclic GMP biosynthesis. So then you have to move that to um, animal models or you know patients or whatever. Actually, that's the next slide. But in the meantime, before I get to that, um, it's not just lipoxygenase that's important in vascular control um, and upregulated in disease and involved in atherosclerosis. Another very important lipid oxidation enzyme in this context is cyclooxygenase. 
So cyclooxygenase 1 in platelets or cyclooxygenase 2, which gets upregulated in inflammation in vascular disease, both of these isoforms are also equally able to catalytically remove nitric oxide during turnover. Um, and we showed this working with Larry Marnett um, at Vanderbilt, who gave us fantastic generous supply of enzymes to work with, and also Jason Morrow, who did a lot of the mass spectrometry, um, and sadly passed away since um, at that time. Uh, he supported our lipid analysis methods, and also um, Stephen Clark over here, who did quite a, a lot of the work on this in my lab. So this was cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, looking both at platelets and looking at uh, macrophages that had upregulated COX-2 and showing again through a quite different mechanism actually that this, these enzymes could also consume NO. Here it turned out to be a peroxidase dependent mechanism. So during peroxidase turnover, cyclooxygenase reduces lipid hydroperoxides to lipid hydroxide. So this is part of how it makes prostaglandins. But of course you've got to um, regenerate the native enzyme again and this involves this can involve removal of nitric oxide as well as other reducing substrates as well, but it works very well with nitric oxide. At the same time we showed this, Stan Hazen showed exactly the same peroxidase cycle could remove NO in myeloperoxidase, which was very nice to be able to see that other peroxidases do this exact same thing. Um, and then Claire Williams showed uh, in the lab that if you uh, give aspirin to platelets, uh, sorry, if you give aspirin to people, I should say, healthy subjects, if they take aspirin, uh, for two weeks, we then isolate their platelets. The cyclooxygenase is then blocked, of course, and they can't consume nitric oxide anymore in response to arachidonic acid supplementation. So, so aspirin, of course, is vasoprotective, um, and you know it made us think. Well, is is there another kind of positive effect to aspirin? Is that it helps uh, prevent accelerated nitric oxide removal in people who have vascular disease or who have problems with elevated platelet activity? So that was kind of the idea of her uh, MD thesis, which showed this really nicely. Um, and then um, we then started to think about, well, we needed to get our own mass spectrometry in Cardiff, really. I think one a, a big question that was, this kind of now leads into the current work that Philip introduced, which is all about phospholipid oxidation and why enzymatic phospholipid oxidation might be important in innate immunity. So this is in around the mid 2000s. I've been sending samples a lot abroad to Stan Hazen and to Jason Morrow and, and to at least one other lab to get mass spectrometry done on them. You know, we used to do all, all our lipidomic mass spectrometry in um, UAB in Alabama with Bruce, but then of course when I moved back to Cardiff I didn't have access to that anymore. So I've been sending it back to, to, to Bruce and to Stan and to Jason. And you know, it is, as anyone in the audience who meet, you know, does get lipidomics done with collaborators will know, everybody's always really busy and there's never enough time on the machines. And so doing it remotely with colleagues is a challenge, especially when you're sending your samples across to the US. So we just decided we better, you know, take the, the leap and set up our own facility because it was really the only way we were going to be able to do this properly. So, and, and the kind of experiments that really pushed me into this were a paper from Hartmut Kuhn's lab, which had come out, you know, around the time we were looking at monocyte lipoxygenase and its consumption of NO. And what Hartmut had seen was interesting and intriguing to me because we were, I had a suspicion that there were a lot more, that the 15LO was making a lot more lipids than we were detecting. Um, you know, we were struggling to get monocytes to activate it acutely. Um, and we were thinking, well, you know, there should be a way, you know, platelets, you give them thrombin and they make a massive burst of, burst of 12 heat. You know, that is really always known, very clear. We see this very obviously. Neutrophils, we activate them with FMLP and we can get five heat. But with monocytes, it was always a bit hit and miss that with ionophore, you could probably get twice as much heat made, but there was no other natural agonists that would just switch on the enzyme. And uh, Hartmut had also shown that this enzyme can attack phospholipids, for example, or um, that when he activated eosinophils with ionophore, as shown here, that he could find, if he, is, if he took the membranes and then hydrolyzed them, he could suddenly recover a lot of heat that was not present before ionophore. And this was heat that was attached, obviously, to complex lipids, but he didn't know what it was attached to. So it, the idea was sort of coming out in the literature that the 15-LO in monocytes was probably attacking complex substrates, which we knew it could do in vitro, and that maybe some of its products were being made attached to other stuff. But what was that other stuff? And so that kind of really encouraged me to set up our own methods to look at this question in detail and try and map out was this phospholipids, glycerides, sterile esters, and, and if it was doing this, why was it doing this? I mean, why would it want to be making 
you know, eicosanoids attached to phospholipids, these were not going to be secreted to do, you know, to act on other cells like a free eicosanoid would. They would be very different in terms of their physicochemical characteristics and potentially their mechanisms of action. So, so we bought a 4000 Q-trap, which was, you know, the earliest kind of Cyex benchtop instrument that everybody was buying back in 2005. And a really nice uh, piece of kit to have in the lab. And we realized very early on that there was a, a method, a mode of scanning that that instrument had that would allow us to answer the question we had. And, and this was because when I went up to visit SciEx and they said to me, you know, what, what, what is it you want to do? You know, what, what research question do you have? And I said, well, I've got these cells and I want to know what lipids they're making that contain 12 heat or 15 heat. And they said, well, there's this thing called precursor scanning. You know, you can get the machine to tell you what lipids it's making that are attached to all this stuff. And, and they demonstrated this. And, and I realized that was going to actually really send us forward quite a lot. And what precursor scanning does is, if anyone on this call, you know, you know about mass spectrometry, will probably know this very well. But you can set up a triple quad to fragment. Or every, it, it, it will scan in Q1. So it's only letting through your you know, molecules one at a time, depending on what resolution you're using. And whatever goes through to Q2 gets fragmented, uh, collision-induced association. And then in Q3, you can monitor for a particular fragment ion. So the, the fragment ion we chose to monitor was 319.2, which is the um, carboxylate anion of the heat that would come if you fragment here. Because obviously with a phospholipid or with any complex lipid like this, you're going to get, you should get fragmentation right here. So if we monitor for 319, what precursor ions contain that? And so this was all done with, with uh, L, initially direct infusion, but then we very quickly switched to chromatography because of, you know, you can get funny adducts formed if you don't separate. And this is the kind of data we got. So this is human monocytes indu induced to express IL-4, um, uh, sorry, induced to express 15 LOX using IL-4, or murine peritoneal macrophages, which already have a lot of 12-15 of methoxygenase, which is the mouse equivalent. And this is what popped up, these four ions here, and the same ones were here, effectively, just, you know, lower, no, a lot of noise because these are weak signals, but they were the same ions. And so we spent a lot of time then working out what the structures were, and you can see them here. In fact, it wasn't four lipids, it was more like six lipids, just because some of PEs and some PCs have got the same mass, actually. Um, so, you know, they will, have, they will appear in the same channels, but they separate on, on uh, reverse phase chromatography, so you can tell them apart. But, we did a lot of MS and MS, MS and MS3 to work these out. And then we started looking at where they were generated and how. And this is the first paper on this, which is 2007. Uh, ben Maskery, who was a postdoc in my lab, led this work. And really here you can just see kind of the difference with, this is before the mass spectrometry, looking at with and without hydrolysis. You know, you activate the cells, you get a load formed if you hydrolyze, but not if you don't hydrolyze. So we knew there was a lot in esterified pools. This is really just the phospholipids. There may well be some in the glyceride pools here and in the cholesterol ester pools here, but we're not looking for them because we're looking in negative ion mode. And that's kind of a limitation of some of those other lipid categories is you've got to look for them in positive ion mode and the, the methods for fishing these out are not so sensitive. But Maria Fedorova has done a lot of work in recent years, I think, to, to, look, to work out how to fish out um, using positive ion methods. And, uh, you know, so there's some really nice approaches that could be brought back and applied to these cells now. And I'm sure we'll find a lot more. So at that point in time, I started collaborating also with um, Bob Murphy in Denver and also Peter Collins, who's a, a hematologist at Cardiff, to try and understand what these lipids might do. We were looking at platelets. Chris Thomas, who was a postdoc then, found and identified and characterized the structures of the platelet analogs. And um, here's some LCMS chromatography and also the MSMS. Um, we, one limitation, we have is standards always with this work, that we can make some standards because we can buy the precursors from Avanti. But with a lot of these lipids, you know, especially some of the plasmalogens, they're, they're, they're not commercially available necessarily. And so, you know, we do work with as many of the, you know, structurally identical standards as possible. But then we just, um, you know, are, as I said, it's a kind of a limitation with the work for quantitation and identification that we don't have all the standards we could do with. But nonetheless, you can see with these standards just how well they match. Um, here's a, on this, this one here, for example, peak two which is this lipid, it's the 180A 12PC, the bottom one there in scheme one, um, and there is in negative ion mode, the MSMS of it, the two fatty acyls coming off and showing really nice peaks, but the standard we made and the platelet lipid are virtually identical in terms of MSMS, and of course their retention times match really well too. So Chris again did the same precursor scanning approach to fish these out and then characterize them. 
this was also the first time we had an idea that they might be involved in coagulation as well. I'll go on to talk about that in more detail further on. Um, Alwena Morgan and Vicky Tyrrell and Stephen Clark also did a lot of work looking at um, DHA-derived uh, analogues that platelets make uh, with 14 h do attached. Um, also neutrophil, uh, the neutrophil-derived ones, which have got five heat attached always. Um, and then we sent, we published some methods, and it, it was also very nice. It came in uh, chemical took our methods and are now commercially have made available some of these lipids uh, that, that people can buy and use as standards now so that that's nice um these are when we we then moved we, we like many of us we acquired a more sensitive instrument about five or six years ago the, the 6500 q-trap with that we've been able to find a lot more lipids in platelets uh, and also actually some of this was done with an orbitrap so it's high resolution um, the, when you start seeing more lipids it becomes a real challenge to work out exactly what they are so i would say these are partially validated. They're all um, they're all synthesized in response to thrombin activation of platelets, and we've got a retention time and an accurate mass for them. And if you look here, for example, you can see that you've got like the same mass but multiple retention times. So it's really a case of you know sometimes you see this this kind of blob of lipids coming out together, and you scan across it, and you can see all of the ions that tell you that these are here. But it's very difficult to really quantify these things without standards and without full structural information. So we we try to be as careful as we can to just name them based on what we know. So based on the SN the, the MSMS, we, we can um, assume we have 22 carbons, five double bonds, and one oxygen attached, for example, in this case. So you know this is as I said partial validation because of the challenges of working with these things when you're going down to low abundance and multiple peaks in chromatograms. The heat peas are always the easiest because there's most of them. Uh, they're the most abundant and you know they're easy to get good good data on. So how are these lipids made? Well, you know, uh, there's a huge literature on non-enzymatic lipid oxidation out there which precedes our work and actually has been really informative because non-enzymatic lipid oxidation goes on in atherocirrhosis and uh, the lipids that are found have got very structural, they're very structurally similar and the bioactivities that many others such as Norbert Leitinger, Judy Berlin or Joe Whitstam and others in seminal work from the 90s and early 2000s did. Um, it, it's really the crossover between the bioactivities of what they saw and what we see and the work we've done is, is virtually identical and I think that's not a surprise really, we would expect that. Um, but in this case the difference is that these lipids are being made by cells under acute activation. So the plate, resting platelets don't really have much of these lipids but when they're activated they switch you know, using thrombin activation of PAR1 and PAR4 calcium mobilization occurs, CPLA2 is activated, you get hydrolysis of fatty acids from the membrane and a very rapid oxygenation to form LOX products and also COX-1 products and these then get re-esterified back in here and this is why I'm interested in the land cycle because this is part of the land cycle, it's the, the recycling and the regeneration of phospholipids within the membrane but this time using icosanoids, prostaglandin E2 we also see in platelets going in but to the you know, major extent 12 heat in platelets. So it's a controlled event. It's not a kind of random, you know, we, if you add large amounts of 12 peach to platelets, it doesn't go into exactly the same lipids and it goes in in a much slower time scale than this. So this is a rapid event that happens within three to five minutes of cell activation and appears to be highly controlled in that, you know, the, this is all controlled and then the reesterification is happening on the same time scale. And about a third of the 12 heat that gets generated is going into the phospholipid pool of platelets. So it is quite a lot going in to the membrane. And so this is our, you know, why we think this is a regulated event and is, has got an, a reg, an, an influence or an importance in innate immunity because neutrophils, platelets, eosinophils, where we see this happen as well, are all cells that get switched on during an, the innate immune response to challenge. So if you cut yourself and you bleed, you don't want to get infected and you want to stop the bleeding. And it seems like the in vitro work, a lot of the in vitro work and some in vivo work as well that we've done, shows bioactivities of these lipids that are consistent with that kind of response, that rapid response you want to happen when you injure yourself. So most of the focus has been on blood uh, coagulation, which I'll show next, but we've also seen in in vitro studies, if we add these lipids, that they can do stuff that's consistent again with kind of an innate immune response, um, such as unsurprisingly acting as PPAR ligands, because most oxidized lipids do act as PPAR gamma ligands, but they will have effects on TLO4 activation um, and effects on cytokine generation, as do many other um, oxidized phospholipids as shown for the non-enzymatic analogues as well, I would say, it's very similar. So, but the interesting thing of course with these is that which ones get made are entirely dependent on what hypoxygenases are present in cells. So in neutrophils, it's all entire, you know, the vast majority are 5 PPEs, 
in platelets, the vast majority are 12 heat PEs, but we see some PG2 PE, and we also see some 11 and 15 heat PEs, which come from cyclooxygenase 1 as well. We know that because we can block their synthesis using aspirin, for example. So I'm not keeping an eye on time, and I probably should just check here. Okay, it's half past now, so, so we'll get on to the, uh, just try and keep us up on time. So we've, um, We'll talk, main, we'll talk about this now in the next part. We've got a review article a few years ago which kind of summarised up to 2019 where we were in all of this. So coagulation, um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with this, uh, coagulation is, is, has a really strong dependence on the lipid membrane and particularly the lipid membrane of platelets because when platelets, platelets and, and white cells, all of them maintain an asymmetric membrane and so they will, using energy and enzymes called flipases and flopases, they will maintain the PC on the outside and they will maintain the PE and the PS, I should have some blue ones here, the PE and the PS are maintained on the inside. And there's an important reason for that. And that is because PE and PS on the outside of cells is a signal. It's not just a signal for apoptotic clearance, but it's also a signal for coagulation to start, for blood clotting to happen. And so platelets, in the resting state and white cells are like this but when platelets are switched on with thrombin or many other agonists they will start to externalize using a scramblaze some PE and PS to the outside. The effect of that is to create an electronegative surface on the outside of the cells and that is essential for the coagulation factors which are in the fluid phase you know factor 10, factor 2, whatever all of the others factor a, uh, here we got 10a and 5a the activated forms this is the prothrombinase complex it's the terminal part of coagulation factors, and it needs this negatively electronegative surface in order to be able to work. Because, and the reason why is quite simple. In the fluid phase, coagulation factors are quite dilute. If you want them to work, you need to bring them together somewhere where they're more concentrated. So they get attracted to this membrane, they come down, they form their complexes, ultimately prothrombin is cleaved to thrombin, um, and then that cleaves fibrinage into fibrin, and you get the fibrin mesh. It's not just platelets, it's also um, neutrophils, uh, eosinophils that seem to be involved in this um, and our question when we saw phospholipids being oxidized in these membranes was well what could that do to this because you know it's, it's quite a lot of phospholipid oxidation it could have a biophysical impact on the membrane it could thin it out it could make it uh, have some permeability but also it might have an effect on how PE and PS are able to interact with coagulation factors that's what I'm showing here so this was the question that we then went on to answer and there was, there's a number of studies uh, from like the, the, the mid, kind of, well, let's say 2007, 2015 on, on, onwards, probably. Um, one from Gerhard Kronke's group, which we did in collaboration with him and also working with Peter, um, where we looked at the knockout mice and could show that either ALOX15, so mice lacking, this, is, this enzyme is mainly in the circulation expressed in eosinophils, whereas this one, ALOX12, is the 15 LOX, sorry, no, this is the platelet 12 LOX, so this is, this is the one in platelets, this is the one that will be in eosinophils, maybe in uh, some uh, monocyte populations, but generally they have to be um, activated to the M2 phenotype before you really see significant amounts. But nonetheless, it's in the circulation in some cell populations, and what, what Gerhard found with both of these was that if he did a venous thrombosis model, the clots were significantly smaller so both these mice strain, mouse strains lacking either ALOX15 or ALOX12, both know we know can make oxidized phospholipids, have, they make smaller clots. Now, of course, that could be down to any number of lipids that are made by, it may not necessarily be oxidized phospholipids, it could be to do with some of the free acid products they make, like the heats or the hodes. But at this point, it was, okay, that's interesting. What is, you know, what's going on here? So in Cardiff, then we set up a tail bleeding assay where we cut the tail of the mouse and then you let it bleed into some warm PBS and you watch how long it takes to stop bleeding. And so this um, was done by Keith Allen Redpath at Cardiff and he showed that a wild type mouse, obviously, they, you know, the tail stops bleeding within around 100 seconds. The ALOX15 or the ALOX12 knockouts, it's very, um, there's a massive spread. Some are like normal and some are not, but clearly there's a significant increase in bleeding time overall. We next then started injecting in tiny amounts of liposomes into the tail, exactly where the tail cut is made, so that the blood would have to flow past liposomes containing these lipids. And what we could see was that small amounts of these liposomes, and we try to keep with amounts that are physiologically relevant. So we know how much platelets make and monocytes make. So we're trying to keep it with amounts that would be relevant to that. We could see that this injection into the tail tissue could restore the hemostasis back to the wild type levels. So it gave a kind of a, a proof of concept that 
you get rid of, of these lipids um, and then you add them back, you can restore normal bleeding. So this seemed to kind of indicate that they may be playing a role in coagulation in vivo. David Slatter then, who was working in the group, did a lot of in vitro and biophysical studies to look at the interactions of heat PEs and heat PCs of all sorts of positional isomers, 15, 9, 12, 8, 11, 5, um, with coagulation factors in vitro to see you know, what's going on when we look with purified proteins. But here we have a plasma-based a plasma assay. So we're looking in uh, regular plasma from healthy people, and we add small amounts of liposomes that contain just either a PC or a small amount of PS, some PE, and we then start to replace some of this PE with the heat PE that we've made ourselves, whether or not it's 11, 5, 8, 9, or 12, or 15. So it gets replaced in. So all you're doing is literally changing one arachidonic acid in one phospholipid. Uh, pool to make this change, but in plasma, uh, and there's also tissue factor in these vesicles to kick off the coagulation. And this is all PS dependent coagulation. Um, but what you can see is that there's a big, big effect of having some heat PEs or heat PCs, it doesn't matter what the head group is, it still works on the thrombin generation ability of this plasma. So he could directly show that if we put these phospholipids in, they can um, increase thrombin generation in plasma. And he also then looked at plasma from people with factor 9 deficiency or factor 11 deficiency and you know look again at thrombin generation you get a small but significant increase in thrombin generation when we add some oxidized phospholipids. Factor 8 which is haemophilia A we could also get some clotting in their plasma which was really nice because you, it's very difficult in this in the context of this factor deficiency to be able to restore coagulation without adding back factor 8 and, and this was, was a really nice finding here. Um, and also mice, which are the, the haemophilia mice, which effectively cannot stop bleeding when you challenge them. So that's what we've got here, a tail bleeding assay, wild type mice, haemophilia mice, factor eight deficient. If, they are, if the tail is cut, they bleed this long, which effectively is bleeding out. But if again, like before, we get small amounts of these lipids into the tail, we can completely stop them bleeding. So this was really a nice proof of concept that the lipids can drive blood coagulation and that may be part of the phenotype we see in the mice is down to defective coagulation because lipids are not present. Um, Sarah Lauder went on working with Peter Collins to look at the generation of heat PEs in people with a human um, venous thrombotic disorder called antiphospholipid syndrome. And if we just look here at the leukocytes and the platelets, she's um, here, forget about the activated ones, just look basally because really we're interested in what's going on in the circulation of people with this disease under stable conditions. And if she isolated white cells, total white cells, or she isolated platelets, and then she measured the amounts of 12 heat PE in the platelets, or 15 or 5 heat PE in the white cells, she was consistently seeing significantly higher levels basally in these people. Um, and she also could show in another assay that these people have an immune response to these lipids. The, the circulating IgG that recognizes these lipids is elevated in these people. Whether that's pathogenic or not is, is unclear right now, but nonetheless, in a thrombotic disorder, we're detecting more. And then Keith Allen Redpath, um, working on a BHF funded project, um, we were interested in we got interested in aneurysms because there was some data coming out that uh, aneurysms, and, and this is now becoming very clinically relevant because the, the data was coming out that a um, coagulation, so an aneurysm, is, as you will all know, is this area in the um, aorta, quite often in the abdomen, abdominal aorta, um, which is Kind of ballooned and it can be full of atheroma plaque and also it will have clots associated with it and you know it's a really nasty condition because quite often they're not found until they rupture and then it can be fatal so if they're found early enough they can be monitored and it's really important to try and find ways to stop them getting worse if they are known to be there and they're quite stable uh, but there was data coming out that coagulation itself might be somehow driving their development um, and some people had shown in mice if they block coagulation they can block development of aneurysms so we wondered whether oxidized phospholipid membranes could contribute to this because they may have a role in driving coagulation. So what Keith did was spend a lot of time back crossing the two strains, the ALOX15 and the alox 12 with APOE deficient mice to set up a model of aneurysms, which is the angiotensin II driven model. So effectively APOE deficient mice, if they're given angiotensin II for two weeks, will develop an aneurysm as shown here. There's the control and there's the aneurysm. If we back crossed with either ALOX15 or ALOX12 knockouts, we could very well protect either male or female mice from aneurysm development. And uh, so we spent a lot of time trying to work out the mechanisms of this. It seems to be something to do with coagulation, but these mice have got some unusual things going on in their circulation that we don't quite understand yet. So 
our kind of hypothesis was that it's to do with you know attracting in coagulation factors into the vessel wall where they have a pro-inflammatory effect in the wall itself and that by getting rid of the oxidized phospholipids we're somehow dampening that down and that may still hold tr true but while we know there is an impact we're still not 100 percent sure of the mechanisms that are involved here and that's ongoing study as part of the second bhf grant that we have active now but just to show that the mice do really lack these lipids, um, the blood does really lack these lipids, here's um, a kind of range of the ones we could pick up that we felt confident we could reproducibly pick up in mouse blood. And then we take blood from mice, whether it's wild type, APOE deficient, ALOX12 deficient, or double knockout or whatever, and then using mass spec um, measure under, so you take the blood and you effectively just let it clot in a tube slowly over time, up to three hours. And basally in the mouse blood, we can detect some of these lipids there already. You can see down here, you can see some of them basally, but a lot of them are just not there until the blood starts to clot. So at various time points, they come up and then some of them seem to go back down a little bit again. But this is what the wild type mouse blood looks like. Here's APOE deficient blood. And then ALOX12, there's a whole swathe of them that just fall under the limit of detection for our machine. So we can probably guess they're coming from ALOX12. At the same time, similar ones are missing from ALOX15 mice, but it does look like, you know, there's a contribution of both enzymes to some of the lipids because they fall under the limit of detection regardless of which gene you delete, uh, whether it's ALOX12 or ALOX15, but less of them seem to be missing in the ALOX15 mice. And then of course, the double, this is um, APOE deficient, you know, some come back, we start to see a bit more because I guess there's a, a more inflammatory, uh, you know, inflammation is, is being driven here in the blood here. So there's a little bit more of those lipids there. But nonetheless, it does show the blood is lacking those lipids in these mice if we knock out those enzymes. Um, and then just looking in the aneurysm lesions of the mice, um, you can, we can reproducibly detect, although it is quite variable, different mice, different lesions. You can see some, but, um, you can see others, but you know, this is a mouse model and there's going to be variability between different mice. But this is what we detect when we look at six different aneurysms from different mice and, and uh, you know, the putative structures we can find. Um, and then we worked with Regent Lee, who has a very nice cohort in Oxford of human aneurysm tissue. And he sent us down samples from six patients from the aneurysm repair operation. And we have aneurysm wall. We've got the thrombus, which is close to the aneurysm. And then we've got the thrombus that's more close to the luminal or to the inner lumen of the vessel itself. And there are many oxidized phospholipids, including a lot of the truncated ones that have always been proposed to be, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is true, you know, proposed to be non-enzymatically generated. We're getting quite a lot of truncated ones too. So there's a mixture here of what's definitely most likely non-enzymatic, but maybe some enzymatically generated ones also, particularly in the clot part, less so in the vessel wall. And this is just a profile here at the moment. We haven't looked into this in any more detail, but they're certainly present in human uh, aneurysm tissue. So I think I'm probably getting um, cut, cutting down on time. So this this there's more to talk about, but I won't get through it, so I'll kind of skip to the end. Um, uh, you know, I always put too much into talks and end up, end up in this situation, so apologies for that. Madge Crotty is a PhD student in my lab who's been looking at acute coronary syndromes. And if people have questions on this, then we can come back and talk about it then. Maybe that's a better way to do it, because I don't want to cut into the question time. He's been looking at healthy controls, people with cardiovascular risk factors, people with stable coronary artery disease, and people with acute coronary syndromes, so the ones having heart attacks, getting peripheral blood off them, looking at their platelets and their white cells and their extracellular vesicles to map out where and which types of oxidized phospholipids are there and how might they be getting controlled. So this is unpublished data for Madge's thesis that I'm going to skip through in the interest of time. And as I said, there are questions more than happy to come back to it. Madge has also done a great job of looking at um, retrieved clots. Uh, as he's a cardiologist, he's been able to link up, link up with clinicians who do clot retrieval um, for post-op in either STEMI, which is um, people having uh, stents put in, limbs, peripheral clots or carotid clots. And we see very interesting signatures that are more platelet driven or white cell driven, depending on which clots we look at. And we need to understand a little bit more about why that is the case. But this is as far as this work has gone so far. Madge has also confirmed the ALOX15 mice. I showed earlier in a, in a Venus clot model, they form smaller thrombi, but Madge working with Alistair Poole in Bristol has been able to look at arterial thrombosis and confirm that they also form much smaller um, arterial thrombi. And we're just looking at the ALOX12 knockouts now to see if we have that same phenotype. So the summary of that is that these lipids appear to be strongly procoagulant in vitro and in vivo. They're generated by several blood cells. Um, it seems to be a robust and conserved response by circulating innate immune cells when you challenge them. Um, they're elevated in vascular disease and we're actively interested in their roles in aneurysms and cardiovascular disease. 
but this it's but it is more complicated than this i've no doubt that there's a lot more going on here than we understand right now because we do see some intriguing things that we're following up like for example do the anticoagulant factors which also like this ele electronegative surface also interact with them so protein s protein c plasmalogen plasminogen these are proteins that are involved in getting rid of clots there's, there's evidence out there that they also need this kind of membrane and uh, you know we have some data we're not sure if there's an involvement or there is but it needs more work to know whether there is an impact of oxidized phospholipids on the removal and the, the, the getting rid of the clot which is a, an active part of the healing process actually so that's going to be interesting um, and you know again this is stuff i don't have time to talk about but this was a paper uh, that um philip mentioned that we published earlier this year it's become more and more clear to us that when we measure oxylipins, I think we're missing an awful lot because they seem to be getting removed incredibly quickly. Now, there's a lot known since the 1980s and the 1990s about metabolites for individual prostaglandins, individual heats, for example. But looking at it in a kind of holistic way during inflammation and asking the question, how are they getting removed, which ones are getting removed and where are they going, has not really been addressed. So we kind of took a first stab at this in this paper that we published. And we really focused more on the, mitochond oops, the mitochondrial pathway whereby some appear to be getting taken up this way and uh, degraded and secreted and you know converted to tetranol products is something I don't have time to go through today but this, this, this is something you know I'd encourage people interested in in this area to think about is we measure steady state levels but I think there's a lot we're missing they're probably making oh god knows 10 times more if not more that we just don't see because it gets removed so fast depending on the situation here this is peritoneal inflammation in mice so um, here's a nice example. Let's look at this, PG2. Very little is made basally in the peritoneal lavage of the mouse. You can block mitochondrial uptake using etamoxia and you get a small increase. When you give LPS, you detect more. But if we block mitochondrial removal, we get a lot more here. But I think this is still only part of it because this isn't taking into account peroxisomal removal or esterification or maybe other pathways that we don't even know about. So looking at, at, at that, the impact of that on signaling, I think is really interesting and, and a lot to be still done. Here we also just mapped out what kind of the transcriptional control networks using some published data on sepsis and other infections. Um, and I just want to give one shout out at the end to lipid maps, I think, um, to people who are not really familiar with lipids or are new to the field or those of us like me who work a lot on lipids. Um, this is something I got involved in about six or seven years ago that had been set up a long time before um, by Ed Dennis and Shankar Subramanian and many others in the US. Um, we had funding from the Wellcome Trust for the last five years and we're in the process of looking at renewal right now. But if you need to look up structures, um, if you need to download databases to do lipidomic searches, if you're new to the field and you want to learn about lipids, we have loads of tutorials, webinars, educational material here. And uh, you know, please do feel free to go and, and, and read, or you know, the excellent weekly blog from uh, Bill Christie, for example. Um, software informatics tools for doing lipidomics is all hosted here. If you don't find what you want, please do feel free to get in touch. But I'm just giving a shout out to this as a resource. Um, it's lipidmaps.org, and I think that's it really. This is I, I'll leave that for now. So. Um, I know there's a lot more people here than are currently in the group, but this a lot of people's work I've talked about today, and I want to give them all credit for that because you know this has really been a massive team effort. Um, it's it's been a great journey so far. We keep finding new questions to ask that are going to keep us busy for a long time more. Um, I'm sure. So uh, you know, I'm excited to keep working in the field of lipid oxidation and looking forward to what what new things we might find um, with the new exciting tools we have because mass spectrometry tools we have now are just brilliant for the kind of questions we want to ask. So um, I think with that, I'll hand back to Philip and um, any questions. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Valerie. That was really uh, superb. And it was wonderful seeing um, the progression of things from the early days of basic mass spectrometry through to uh, the super technology that's available now. So. Um, just a reminder that, that uh, you can put your questions in the question tab and also uh, that Valerie was giving this uh, webinar as recipient of the 2022 Morton Lecture, which started back in 1978 and is awarded every two years. And it's awarded for somebody who has made an outstanding contribution to lipid biochemistry. And I think we've just seen, Valerie, uh, you're a very worthy 
recipient of this award and you have made um, a series of really important contributions to uh, lipid biochemistry and lipid physiology, I would say, putting the biochemistry in the physiological context. So well done. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you, for you, Valerie. So um, one of them you sort of touched on early on, which is people usually think of bioactive lipid mediators as being free. And you're talking about things bound in phospholipids. And I wondered if for any given um, oxidized fatty acid, if you like, what the relationship between the free and the bound is, and does that differ according to the different oxidized uh, fatty acids? Gosh, you know, that's a massive question, isn't it, really? And it's so <laughs> context dependent, I suppose. I mean, if we pick an example, I mean, I think one really good example of a phospholipid that is extremely potent and has a very specific signaling pathway, which is receptor dependent, would be PAP, you know, mm -hmm. which has been known about yep. for a long time. And PAP has a receptor and it's made in vanishingly small amounts. And this is, but it's really well established that it, it is formed and it's there. And, it, and it's so, it, it also is so important that the structure is exactly PAP. You know, if you don't have that plasmalogen structure at the SN1, it doesn't signal. So that's probably the best example of, of a potent phospholipid signaling mediator that I can think of that really has its own receptor and is vanishingly small amounts of needed to signal. The ones I talked about today, I think it's a bit different in that, you know, whether or not it's a, a, a 12 or a 15 heat, when it comes to coagulation, it doesn't really matter that much because we're talking about biophysical changes in a membrane where, you know, a little bit of electronegativity is enhancing PS's ability to do its job. Or if it's PPAR signaling, again, you don't need to have that specific structure. Lots of oxidized lipids made at the same time will activate PPAR, so it's more of a sensing of, of large numbers. The GPCR signaling is, seems to be the really specific part where vanishingly small amounts do very specific things, and that would apply to PG2, D2, prostacycline, and thromboxane. So it's like they, the free ones seem to stratify into you know, the, the, recept, the, the GPCR part for those very well-established ones. Um, or they can also interact with PPAR, whereas with phospholipids, apart from PAP, it seems more like it's a kind of a, you know, biophysics of the membrane and what's going on there, because they don't really get secreted. They're too lipophilic to get secreted. I mean, PAP, yeah. obviously, it's only got one real fatty acid attached to it, so it's yes. less lipophilic it can get secreted. Yeah. So I think, you know, if, it really depends, doesn't it, on the cells and, you know, it depends on the cells and the enzymes that are there at the time and whether or not it's going to be a big burst of PG2 to go off and have an effect on the immune system. The small amounts of PG2 that ends up end up in phospholipids, I don't know whether they do much at all. I don't think we have a good answer to that with PG2 at all. Um, but you know, th then Larry Marnett has done a lot of work on PG2 esterified to other functional groups, you know, like the, the endocannabinoids and, and mm -hmm. those sorts of forms, and seen very interesting activities of those. So. Yeah, it's a huge question. I don't think I have an easy answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Really. No, 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 no. It's, it's, good, it's good to hear that, um, yeah. you know, a little bit is known, but there's still a lot to find out. So that's oh, great. Yeah. Um, so, so related to that, so when you were talking in, in the latter part about um, the studies in mice and so on, and you referred to um, these oxidized phospholipids you said in the blood, and I just would like clarification is, does that mean uh, that in cells circulating in the blood or are they circulating freely in the blood? Yeah, I don't think they are circulating. No, so in those experiments, um, generally what we were doing was taking, I, can't, I need to go back and check the methods for those mouse ones, but we've done quite a bit with human blood, which we still haven't gotten around to publishing. And, and yep. there we were taking blood letting it clot and spinning it out so you'd have the serum separate and um, from what I remember of those experiments anything that was you know to us likely to be from an enzyme let's say a full length heat or something you know not truncated was always with the spun out part the cell part yeah. whereas so but quite often still in the serum part we would see the truncated ones still there so I wondered whether they were either free or associated with lipoproteins, maybe, because mm -hmm. there is a lot of descriptions of the truncated ones being associated yeah. with LDL and stuff. So they would tend to, they tended to stay with the serum when we would spin it, whereas the heats and those would not, they would come down. 
and the biology of that, I, I, you know, I was also interested to see in one or two donors, we were seeing basally the truncated ones and they would somehow look like they were disappearing when the clot was forming. And I don't know whether that was a different partitioning or not. It's, it's unpublished stuff. We need to go back and revisit and look at it in more detail and, and write up actually. That. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely non-enzymatic stuff going on. And, and, and also the, I think one big question I have, which has never been answered is, it's not enzymatic, but just, it must have started somewhere. You know, there's got to have been a metal ion involved and some hydroperoxides involved. And where did they come from? And, and could it be that the enzymes kicked off something and then the, the tissue wasn't, was a little bit compromised in terms of thiols and GSH. So a bit of propagation happened and then it becomes the non-enzymatic part. But it sort of started from somewhere. And even though it's non-enzymatic in terms of the products, where did it originate from? And were the enzymes yeah. somehow involved in the initial phases and... You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were, but we don't know, you know, we just don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, I was going to yeah. ask you about human blood, but you, you, you've you gone on to mention that already. Um, so so another question I had, Valerie, was whether, um, so, so something like the heat, for example, um, you already mentioned, you know, can be free or bound. Yeah. And um, do you, so this is a bit, um, Provocative, I suppose, because you're suggesting the the phospholipid form has a has a biological activity. But do you think it's also there to buffer the amount of the free mm. mediator? Because I mean, you said the free mediators are really pretty potent. So is this a way of controlling the free level? Yeah, and you yeah, yeah that that's something. Cycle, of course, which is yeah, that that comes up quite a bit, I think. And and uh, oh yeah, definitely, that's that's something that that's, that's interesting because. There's some old studies back from the 1980s where um, people uh, in, you know, this would be Bob, I think, and Charlie Sirhan and others, they were adding heats to cells like neutrophils and monocytes and looking at their incorporation into phospholipids. And in those studies, it was very clear that that does happen. It's slower uh, than what we see. And uh, for example, if we give deuterated 12 feet to platelets, we don't see it getting incorporated in this time scale of five minutes at all. You know, so I think it's a different process, but it definitely does happen that cells will detect what's out there and they will incorporate it and then the question is whether that sits in the membrane and gets re-released in response to a second signal so i think there was some evidence at that time so one of charlie's papers showed that in neutrophils if they were given 15 heat it could go into pi and then i think fmlp was used as an agonist and it got released again so you know that was kind of a story of maybe phospholipids can be a storage pool for our cosmonauts. so so that that idea has been around for a while, and and maybe maybe it, maybe it can. Just, but how how it then relates to um, being you know quantitatively important versus this kind of mechanism, I honestly don't know. You know, I think we haven't looked really at that probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but Valerie, that's great. Um, our our delegates or our attendees are still with us, but nobody has asked a question. So. Um, I think I've used up the question time anyway. So thank you so much, Valerie. Um, and thanks um, to all the attendees for um, for uh, uh, joining today. Um, you can continue with the uh, by following at BiochemSoc and at PP Publishing on Twitter, um, so you can uh, continue the conversation. Um, the society welcomes suggestions for future topics and speakers as part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. If you have an idea for a webinar in 2022, um, submit it to uh, the society. You can find out more about the webinars. You can propose your webinar and watch previous recordings at www.biochemistry.org forward slash webinars. Um, look at the website for future webinars. But if you've missed any of the more than 40 webinars that have already happened, or you want to watch them again because they were so good, um, you can visit the website or the YouTube channel. Um, the recording of today's webinar will be available to watch in the next couple of uh, couple of weeks. So uh, the links are up on the screen now. And just remember, um, although we are returning a little bit more to normality, that it's really important to stay connected and to engage. And these online events are a really important uh, way of doing that. So thanks very much to everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of the day and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you.